Hello, and welcome to the Exchange Mobility video as part of the Exchange Technical Video Series. I'm Ann Vu, and I'm here with my teammate, Adam Glick. So Adam, what are, we, what are we going to be talking about today? Hi, Ann. We're going to talk about Exchange Mobility. We'll go through what mobility means in Exchange. We'll talk a little bit about Exchange Active Sync and how that plays into that role. And then we'll go through a number of scenarios about devices and organizations, about how devices are kept in control by organizations, how they protect their organization from which devices connect, and how they can make sure that those devices are doing the right things that they expect. And then we'll take a look at what happens and how people can protect from IP theft or IP loss in an organization all around mobile devices. Great, so what does Exchange Mobility encompass? So when we think about Exchange Mobility, one of the things I like to think about is kind of this diagram here of all the data that you store in Exchange. So think about your email, your contacts, your calendar, okay. all of your critical business information, and about how you take that information from Exchange and you put it into a mobile scenario, say like a tablet or a phone form factor. Okay. Great. So people are um, bringing more and more devices and bringing their own smartphones. So how does an IT organization deal with uh, their end users bringing all these different devices into work? So when you think about the consumerization of IT, you have lots of people who are going and buying their own devices, like you say, and bringing them into an organization. That can create a challenge for an organization of how do you support those things. With Exchange Active Sync, what we've done is we've gone in and we've licensed this broadly. So in all, we have over 30 Exchange Active Sync licensees. Almost every smartphone that you can think of on the market either comes with Exchange Active Sync natively built into the device or available as a third party piece of software that you can install onto that device. Okay. So you have a broad support of devices, and here's just some of our partners that we have in that. So that when people buy their devices and they want to connect them to their workplace Exchange server, it's very easy. They can go, they can configure it, and the IT department doesn't have to worry about having to provision that. They can if they want to, but they can make that very easy, frictionless process if they choose to, all around what's important to the IT department and how much control and protection they want to apply. So that sounds great, but with so many different choices, how does an IT department kind of pick uh, devices that have a level set of features so they can more easily support their end users? This is a great question. Because one of the things we saw with all the various devices that support it, literally there are hundreds of Exchange Active Sync enabled devices these days, is there's so many different devices out there. How do we know which ones support the policies that our organization wants to apply? Mm -hmm. So that's why we created the Exchange Active Sync logo program. Okay. So the logo program program takes a, here's some of our partners that we have in it right now, Nokia, Windows Phone, Apple, mm -hmm. and it makes sure that those devices meet a minimum functionality bar. We've defined that bar, and there's a slide at the end. You can see, look up what the criteria that we have for that, but mm -hmm. things like making sure that you can remote wipe the device, that you can apply a pin policy to it, that you can control it with the allow block and quarantine list that we'll talk about in a little bit, okay. and that that's easily identifiable for people. So you can look at a website, you can see if those phones are indeed supported. You can actually look and see there'll be logos on their website websites and okay. on the boxes for those devices and on the device itself. So when you're setting it up, you'll be able to see that logo, you'll understand that, and IT departments can say, hey, these are the devices that we're going to support. And all those devices with the functionality bar is tested by a third party. So that's actually a third party that people send their devices to. It uh, gets tested, okay. and then they get certified for the logo. Well, if an IT department wants to still limit the types of devices that their end users are allowed to connect to Exchange, how do they do that? So. Once they've decided what devices they want to support, an organization needs to think about, OK, great that we know that we want to support a certain set of devices. Mm -hmm. How do we actually enforce that? How do we make that happen? So how do we make that so, happen? With Exchange Active Sync, we have a feature called the Block Allow Quarantine List. Okay. And the Block Allow Quarantine List basically lets you look at all the devices that you have in your organization, mm -hmm. either what's connecting now or what may connect in the future, and make rules about those the same way you might make rules about email or rules about the firewall okay. in your organization. What do you want to let in? What don't you want to let in? And you can do it by a specific device, say die, tie a device to a particular user. Okay. Or you can do it broadly, say, we're going to support all Windows phones, and so all Windows phones are okay to access. It's up to the IT department to decide what those rules are. But they can define those rules based upon the person, okay. based upon the device or the family of devices, and they can also choose what happens if it sees something that they've never seen before. What do they do? So if we take a look at a flow diagram of that, just to kind of understand the okay. logic before I'll show you a demo of it. Here's kind of the way that if you were to think through the flow, what, how that happens. So if you had an allow list, so you say, we're only going to allow four devices. We have these four supported devices mm -hmm. for our IT department. OK, so the device will come into the organization. First, it basically says, 
who is this person? Is this a person that has a special rule for them? Okay. The answer to that is no. Then you say, okay, do I know this device? Yes, this is a, one of our supported devices. Mm -hmm. Let it connect. What happens if it doesn't meet either of those two rules? What should we do? And you would say, okay, I'm gonna block that. Okay. That's a standard allow list, and yeah. many organizations choose to do that. Mm -hmm. Now on the flip side of that is a block list. Let's say that you say, we're a very broad organization, we wanna allow everything to connect, but we really just want the ability to, let's say there's a security exploit with a particular device or set of devices, mm -hmm. and so when that happens, we wanna stop those devices from accessing until there's a patch available for those devices. Yes. So you can do the exact opposite then, and you can say, basically allow everything through except for this particular set of devices, and those devices we wanna block. So it's just the inverse of that. Same rule, you're just pointing it a different direction. Okay, makes sense. One of the questions we get about that is, okay, what about the special case? So you've got a CEO who says they want a particular device or the IT department wants to try out a new device before they make it broadly available to everyone in the organization. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you can actually specify rule on the person. That's why person came before device. I so see. we can say, okay, the director of IT is gonna test out this new device to make sure it's applicable for the workplace environment. So we're gonna apply it to them, we're gonna allow them to access with it, but anyone else who has that device can't use it. Sure. So that's kind of a specialized rule. And then beyond all that is kind of a catch-all of what happens if there's no, no rules that have been applied to all those? What happens to a brand new device that comes out so you haven't set a rule about it? Mm -hmm. What do you want to happen? And you have the ability, of course, to block or allow that. Yeah. But you can also set that to quarantine. What that means is when the device connects in, you can contact an administrator and say, hey, this device, and it gives you information about the device, is mm -hmm. trying to connect. Do you want to allow it or not allow it? Okay. And that person's device will get a message saying, your device is in quarantine. You can set a specialized message on that. I'll show you that in a second. And through those two pieces, you then are able to make the decision, give IT the control to say, let it in, don't let it in, but never have anything connect that you wouldn't want to connect. Great. So that's kind of the easy flow diagram on that and the three different questions that people have to ask as they set up the allow block and quarantine list. Okay. So can I show you a demo of that? Yes, let's look at a demo. So here we're taking a look at the exchange control panel. Okay. So the administrator in this case can go in and they're looking at the exchange active sync setup for the allow block and quarantine list and they can choose to create a new rule. So we're starting as if it's a new organization here. So we can choose to edit it. We can choose what's our default sol solution when there is no rule applied. Okay. So if it doesn't know what the device is, do we want to allow it anyways? Do we want to certainly block it? Or do we want to quarantine it? So we're going to choose to quarantine that device. Okay. Then we can choose who do we want to notify when that device is quarantined. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to add our administrator, who's Tomas Navarro. So the exchange control panel is available both on-prem and online, correct? That's correct. And so anyone who's having an exchange experience will be able to administer their experiences through these web consoles, whether on-premise or online. That's great. So we've chosen that. And then finally, you can choose what's said in that email. So let's say, call Tom after 24 hours if still not connecting. You will probably write something slightly nicer, but just for evidence sake, we'll put that in there. That's fine. And save it. So now we've decided what happens with devices we don't know. Mm -hmm. You can then see that there's, currently there's no quarantine devices. We yep. just set this up. Nothing we bad. also have no rules. So if you wanted to say there's certain devices you don't want to have to go through that process, you can go and add a rule. So in this case, if I go create a new rule, mm -hmm. I can choose the device family. In this case, I'll choose this Samsung device. It's a licensee of ours. And I add them. And I say that they're going to allow and all devices in that family. And there we go, that's it. So all the Samsung devices that want to connect will automatically connect or that particular model of Samsung devices versus all other devices are going to go to a quarantine state. Okay. Let's see what that quarantine looks like. So if we look at the administrative console, we look now and see that under quarantine devices, we now have a new device listed. Okay. Bob Kelly's here. He's got a Windows phone device made by Samsung. We can see that he's connected that device recently. So as administrator, we know what devices are and we can make the decision to allow that device. So if I just selected it, I could choose allow or block. I could create a rule for similar devices. Mm -hmm. I'll just allow this one for Bob Kelly. And once that's allowed, it disappears from quarantine mm -hmm. and the user's device is then able to sync. Okay, so that's the administrator's experience. What does it look like for an end user to try to connect to a device? Or Here, to I'll connect show you. to the exchange server? 
So here you can see the screen of my Windows phone. And this phone is Bob Kelly's phone. And so if I open up his Outlook experience, you can see that he's got a new message. And you can see the title of it right there, kind of gives us an idea of what it's going to be. But if we open up that message, we'll see that his phone is being blocked. And it tells him what he needs to do. You can see the full message about that. And you can even see the little message that we typed in uh. about call Tom after 24 hours of still not connecting. And so the administrator is able to communicate with people. They're informed, so they don't say, hey, I tried to connect to the device. I don't know what's going yeah. on. And everything's able to be effectively controlled and accessed. Right now, since we gave him access, if anyone sends email, Bob will just receive that mail on his device and go about his job as normal. So that's really great that we can allow IT administrators to control which devices they want to connect to their exchange environment. Mm -hmm. But can IT administrators do more granular policies if they want to um, be able to block things that some users can do? Absolutely. So when you think about protecting a corporate environment from mobile devices, you want to make sure not only that you protect them at the outset, like a firewall, but you also want to be able to protect what they can do once they've connected. Okay. And so with Exchange Active Sync, we have a robust list of policies. You can see some of them on the slide behind us here. They fall into basic categories. So policies around syncing, how much data you allow to go to that particular device. Okay authentication, what they have to do to connect. Are they going to be required to have pin policies? How long should the pin be? How many guesses do they get before the device wipes the data off it? Should it be alphanumeric? How, much, how complex it should be? Okay. Also policies around encryption. So encrypted email, are you going to force them to send encrypted messages or IRM protection? Are you going to encrypt the physical device itself or a storage card that's connected? Are all part of the encryption policies. Okay. And then more of the policy we have around the control pieces for an administrator. So device control, things like saying, maybe you don't want cameras to be used in your environment, and so you can shut the camera off on the device. Okay. Or you want to be able to take, turn off Wi-Fi or take Bluetooth and say you can only connect a Bluetooth headset, but you can't, say, tether it to a computer to create a way out of the corporate network that might not go through your regular security controls. Yeah. You can also control things like applications. So you can have an allow or block list for applications on the device or that might be installed on the device. Okay. So all these are built around the idea of giving administrators control over what happens on the phone. So okay. we connected Bob's phone before. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens when we apply a pin policy to make sure that he has to log in and that someone that doesn't find his phone can't just go paging through the information there. Great. How does that work? Let me show you. So here we're looking at the Exchange Control Panel again. And okay. versus before we were looking at Exchange Active Sync Access, we're now looking at Exchange Active Sync Device Policy. Now Exchange enforces a default policy to make sure there's always a policy on the device, but you can choose what that policy is. And right now, since it's a brand new organization, we don't have anything applied to that. So we'll open up just by double clicking on the default policy. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply a PIN policy. So make sure that people have to type in a password before they access it. So, here we've got the screen, and you can see all of our policies are listed and grouped together. So in this case, let's take a look and say device security, and we'll say require a password. And so we'll allow simple passwords. We'll make it fairly simple. We don't want to add a lot of these for the sake of demonstration. But as, as you can see, there's a lot of different policies you can apply. And organizations can decide which of those policies and how complex they want to be with it. We'll just say that we're going to require a password, and we'll choose save. So now we've changed the default policy. That default policy was automatically applied to Bob's phone. So why don't we take a look at what it looks like for Bob now that the new policy is going to be pushed down to his mobile device. Great. Let's look at the phone. So as we can see on Bob's device here, he automatically gets prompted for setting up a new password. It tells him what he needs to do. In this case, he needs at least four digits. So he would just tap on set, and we'll pick a new password. And we'll confirm that password to make sure he didn't type it accidentally and then forgets the password. Click done, and that's it. Now, every time that his device is locked or times out, say after about five minutes, then he'll need to be prompted for that password, and he will enter that to make sure if someone picks up his device who's not him or takes it somewhere, they won't be able to access the information that's stored on the device of the email, contacts, and calendar we spoke of. So you mentioned previously somebody picking up the phone and flipping through it. So I know that a lot of people accidentally leave devices in taxis or on the subway. How do we make sure that beyond the pin lock, we are able to protect the contents on the phone itself and not just um, be able to get through that sort of pin lock and access that IP for companies? Sure. Certain organizations are concerned, say, like the four-digit pin we showed might be, not be the level of protection they want. Or what happens if someone starts guessing at that? How many yeah. Yeah. do they get? And so we enable a technology of remote wiping the device. Okay. So if someone guesses, and you can 
give people a selection of how many choices they get. The administrator can choose how many times they get to try before it wipes. Or either a user or administrator can go and wipe a device. So let's assume that Bob Kelly lost his device and he was visiting you know, a client or talking about a merger or an acquisition, someplace where he's conscious of what's on his device not, might not be information that he wants other people to be able to pick up and look through. Mm -hmm. We enable you to go take and wipe all of the information off of that device. It's very easy. Both the user or IT department can do that. Let me show you what that looks like. Perfect. So here we're looking at Bob Kelly's mailbox. And so Bob Kelly could log in. And again, the administrator can do the same thing. Go into his options and go see all the options. Choose his phone, mobile phones. And here's that Windows phone that we talked about. So select his phone and click wipe device. And this is going to remove all data. He's warned about that, mm -hmm. that this is going to remove all the data because it goes and literally factory resets it. Everything goes off of the phone. Select yes. And once he selects that, your wipe is pending. Once it receives notification from the device that wipe has happened, that wipe pending will actually change to say the wipe has been completed. But that's great because it allows IT administrators to uh, do it or have end users do it themselves so it saves the help desk call. Exactly. We empower people to do that so if your help desk isn't 24 hours, you don't have to worry that that device is out there being accessed yeah. until the time that the help desk can come about. So if we look, we can see that it's changed from pending to now saying the remote device wipe was successful. That was fast. So we know that that wipe has been completed. You have confirmation of that. On the device, there's really nothing to see because the device all of a sudden just goes black and appears to have rebooted, mm -hmm. and as part of its boot process, is wiping everything away. Okay. Now, what it'll do is it'll actually, if that device ever tries to connect again, it will continue to send that wipe command to it to mm -hmm. make sure that no one tries to fake a confirmation or pretend oh. that it was wiped when it wasn't. Okay. And so you can go in. To stop it from continuously wiping the device, you simply select it, and then you could either cancel it, or you could just simply remove the device. So the next time someone tries to connect that device, it'll go back through that quarantine process or the approval process right where we started all of this. Okay. And so we'll just remove it from Bob's so that next time he wants to connect that, he won't have that problem. And we're done. Perfect. So today we looked at all the different parts of Exchange Active Sync. The broad range of devices that people can connect, all the different partners that are there, as well as for organizations that want a device that's tested to a minimum security bar, a list of partners who that is, and how they can identify those devices. We also took a look at, once you've selected what devices you want to allow or not allow in your organization, how you can control that access through the allow block and quarantine list. Mm -hmm. And then the devices that do connect, what policies you can apply to them to control what they do when they're connected to your enterprise. Finally, we covered how to protect intellectual property on devices that leave the organization or might have been lost or stolen by doing a remote wipe. So what are some good resources that people should check out to learn a, a little bit more about Exchange ActiveSync and our mobility story? Certainly. If you think about resources that people want to look at, get in your web browser, go take a look at the Exchange Mobility site as part of Microsoft.com slash Exchange. You can also read the Exchange blog. It's a great place to get technical information along with TechNet and find out what's going on with Exchange Active Sync, see how to's on how to configure some of these pieces. Great resources to learn more and see how things are done. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the Exchange Mobility video. Please check out some of the resources that Adam had mentioned. Also, check out our Microsoft Exchange blog and our other videos in the Exchange Technical Video Series, including topics that you might be interested in, such as Outlook or Outlook Web App. Thanks.